Reggie Littlejohn. She is president of Women's Rights uh, Without Frontiers. And uh, tell us about your organization. Well, we are an international coalition to combat forced abortion, gender side, that is the sex selective abortion of baby girls, mm -hmm. and sexual slavery in China. And what are the numbers, just to give people an idea of what, what's going on here? Well, in the United States, we've had about 55 million abortions. Uh, Canada, I understand the number is about 2.5 to 3 million. In China, the Chinese Communist Party boasts that it has prevented 400 million lives, which is more than the entire population of the United States and Canada combined. And they just released figures that, through the one-child policy, that they've had 336 million abortions. And I would argue that since those abortions are directly related to the one-child policy, that they were all forced. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 13 million abortions a year, which comes out to about 35,000 a day, or almost 1,500 per hour, mm -hmm. many of them forced. They also said that they have sterilized 200 million women. Mm. And these sterilizations are violent. There have been two cases just in the last six weeks where women have died in connection with forced sterilizations. So this is the biggest uh, women's rights issue, in fact, the, the biggest human rights issue in the world today just because of the sheer numbers involved. You know, China has one-fifth of the world population, so one out of every five women in the world is suffering under the one-child policy. And a percentage of those abortions that are women in China, do they know those numbers? Or? Well, th this is the thing, the gender side, the sex-selective abortion of baby girls, there are no official figures on that because nobody reports that they aborted right. their girl, right. their, their baby, just because she was a girl because that's actually illegal in China. It's illegal in India, which are the two main, main places where it happens. But according to one UN expert, up to 200 million women are missing in the world today due to sex-selective abortion. And in China alone, there are 37 million more men than women living. And and what that is doing is it's driving human trafficking and sexual slavery, not only in China, but the surrounding countries as well. Mm. And what is driving the, uh, the gender selection period? What is the motivation for it? There is a phenomenon called sun preference that is very prevalent in Asia, particularly China and India, but you even have it in other places like El Salvador and Albania. This is not just an Asian problem. But in China and India, uh, boys are favored because they carry on the family name, they're the ones who work the field, they're the ones who, who do their, um, their funerals for their parents, and very significantly, under in, traditionally in both China and India, when a couple gets married, the young woman leaves her family and becomes part of the boy's family, and then that couple supports the boy's parents. Mm -hmm. So that if you have a girl, particularly under the one child policy, if your only child is a girl and you lose her when she marries the boy, you have no one to support your, your, yourself in old age. So many people feel like they have a choice between destitute, being destitute in their old age or committing gendercide. Right. I don't know, I've spoken to missionaries in China, they talk about this, the pressure when a family does just have one child, the pressure on that poor son or daughter even to provide for the family, there's an incredible amount of pressure on that person to perform. And uh, so there's all kinds of... What is the... Uh, I know last night you mentioned uh, the Communist Party's motivation in China. Tell us about that. Well, I believe that the one-child policy is keeping the, is keeping the Chinese Communist Party in place. I believe that whereas it may have started out as a population control program, that right now that, that they keep it in order to uh, control their population through terror. In other words, this is social control masquerading as population control. And the reason I believe that is that it makes no demographic sense for them to continue the policy. We've already talked about the gender discrepancy and how that is causing a lot of unrest in Chinese society. And they also have the problem of an aging population. Uh, they are growing old before they grow rich. They have a very large aging population. They do not have a young population to sustain it. And so 
uh, really the population problem in China is not that they have too, too many, many people, yeah. it's that they have too few yeah. young people. Right. And their demographers have been saying this for years. So if, if it makes no sense for them to continue the policy, why are they doing it? Right. I think it's keeping the Chinese Communist Party in power. And you had some other reasons too, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. So the first reason is I think that it, that it instills terror. The second reason is the infrastructure of coercion. In other words, they have a massive infrastructure to coercively enforce the one-child policy. That infrastructure of coercion can be turned in any direction. Mm. So that if they have an uprising or if people try to organize for democracy, they can turn it to put that down. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's second reason, to maintain this tremendous yeah. infrastructure of coercion. The third reason is that they, the one-child policy is enforced through a system of um, paid informants. So that a woman who is illegally pregnant, meaning that she's pregnant without a birth permit, mm -hmm. can be informed on by her neighbors, her friends, her co-workers, in some places, they ha are, have people who are paid to just sit there in, in the street and look at women's abdomens as they walk by, see if anybody mm -hmm. looks pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't trust anyone to not inform on you, then you can't trust anyone to organize for democracy, right? Because right. you don't know who's going to turn you in. Right. So this is a way of keeping down anything yeah. like an Arab Spring in right. China. Right. And then the fourth reason I believe that the one child policy is keeping the Chinese Communist Party in place is that there's a lot of money involved, mm. okay? The, the, the cadres, the officials, they extract enormous fines, up to 10 times a person's annual salary for them to have an out of, of uh, plan birth. Mm. And so this is a way of, of the officials feathering their own pockets or lining their own pockets and also um, uh, of financing other things that the Chinese Communist Party does. They can't afford to let go of the one child policy because they can't afford to, to let go of the ability to extort these enormous fines from people. You know, it seems so hif horrific, you know, and it comes out in your talk and the way you describe it. It almost seems like it's beyond any kind of natural conclusions. Do you ever sense that in your work? That it's, um, I hate to use the word demonic, but it just seems sometimes so horrific that it's like, who could come up with this? You know, forced abortions, you know, women sometimes dying on the, the tables, the procedure tables. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, mm. and, and the thing is that to the Western mind that we can't even believe that this stuff is happening. Yeah. And when I come out with, with these cases and I come out with the documentation, people just say, my gosh, I had no idea that this is what was going on in China. And I, and I have empathy for them because when I was a lawyer in San Francisco sitting at my desk in my very civilized life, and I got this email about this woman who had been forcibly sterilized and I started researching it. I couldn't believe that women on the other side of the world in this day and age are being strapped down to tables and forced to abort babies up to the ninth month of pregnancy right. and that these women are dying. And same thing with forced sterilization. Right. It's happening right now to one out of every five women in the world that are suffering under the one-child policy. Right. I noticed in your talk last night when you showed some of the pictures of um, of some of the children that have been saved, um, that you had such a spark of joy, and I could see that, like a feminine charism, that joy of life and things that uh, I just love to see that. And the Pope John Paul II talked about a new feminism where women have a special sensitivity to life. And I, I you know, obviously you're a Yale Law grad, and you have all the power behind it, <laughs> and also you have. Uh, I think that that joy in life itself. Can you talk about that? Well, yeah. I mean, people say, "How do you how do you keep going?" Mm -hmm. When, especially when you know you wake up in the morning and there's another case, a brutal case of a woman who's been forcibly aborted or even died in mm -hmm. a forced sterilization. And when I feel really discouraged, I think about our Save a Girl campaign where we are literally saving lives of babies in China. People can donate, and then we go to these women who have been, um, you know. Who, who, who have had an ultrasound, who know they're having a girl, who have scheduled themselves for abort an abortion. We have a field worker that will go to them and say, look, don't abort your baby. We'll give you a monthly stipend to help you support this baby. And as far as I know, we have a 100% success rate. All these women have kept their daughters. And I could go through this. I have a book of the babies that were, we've saved. And I just look at their little faces and I say to myself, you know what? My life is worth living, and I'm happy that I have this day. Right. And you also spoke about an exciting day for you when the... Tell us about that. Yeah. 
Well, Women's Rights Without Frontiers led the international coalition to free Chen Guanchen and uh, through an absolutely miraculous series of circumstances, he was able to escape house arrest and uh, it was a long and hard battle that lasted over years. Mm. But it was the most exciting day of my life when he touched down uh, in the United right. States. May yeah. 19, 2012, I will remember for the rest of my life. Yeah. I had this image of you running across the tarmac and embracing. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you what. I was invited, actually, uh, by a, co a congressional representative to get uh, on the plane wow. and walk him off, mm -hmm. walk Chen and his family yeah. off together with his representative, Congressman Chris Smith. But uh, the State Department made sure that that would not happen. So unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. uh, he did not get the hero's welcome that was prepared for him yeah. in New York City. Okay. But I did meet with him for um, several weeks later it was the most intense meeting of my entire life because he had been told about me in China. And uh, he held both of my hands in both of his hands mm -hmm. for an hour and 40 minutes. And mm -hmm. I was able to show him, we'd done a sunglasses campaign. Uh, we had 500 people from all over the world wearing sunglasses and sending their pictures to my website. Because he's, he's Because blind. he's blind and he wore sunglasses. sunglasses. They, people mm -hmm. from all over the world sent pictures of themselves wearing sunglasses in honor of him. Um, we had 11,000 signatures on a petition. We had this awesome video that people tweeted all over the world when they wanted people to take mm -hmm. action for Chen Guanchen. And I never did I think that I would be sitting in New York City and actually showing him and his wife this stuff. And we were all in tears. We were laughing. We were crying. Um, and, in, and at that point, I just felt every single sleepless night, right. every dollar that was spent, yeah. every you know, every time yeah. I was pulling my hair out about what was happening with him was yeah. worth it just for yeah. that moment. And his quote-unquote crime was? His crime was that he exposed the fact that there were 130,000 forced abortions and sterilizations just in his city, Lindy yeah. City, in one year in 2005. So if you multiply that out, 130,000 in one city in one year, and you multiply it out across all of China, you can see that this is a very vast and systematic use of coercion in the enforcement of the one-child policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chinese Communist Party didn't like the fact that he exposed that to the world, and so then they threw him in jail. He used the internet to expose it, or? I'm not sure exactly yeah. the means. I'm sure he yeah. did use the internet, yeah. but um, but it did. the word did get out, and mm -hmm. he was named by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 uh, people of the year. Mm -hmm. He got something called the Mag Sese Award, which is the Asian equivalent of the Nobel Peace Prize. And at, in the same time frame, he was thrown in jail, tortured, denied mm. medical treatment. Wow. Um, and now his family is being heavily persecuted. His nephew, Chen Kegui, uh, is in jail for, 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 for defending himself when the Chinese Communist thugs tried to drag him out of, of their home. Um, and he has acute appendicitis which they're not allowing, the jail is not allowing him out to have surgery, mm. so he, so his life is actually in danger. And then just yesterday morning, uh, his Chen Guanchen's brother, Chen Guangfu, was stopped and, and beaten up on the street very seriously. Mm. So they're doing everything they can to silence him by heavily persecuting his family. Wow. Well, God bless you for your work. Thank you. And uh, thanks for talking with us. Oh, thank you very mm. much. I'm here uh, with uh, Chloe Joey from uh, Hamilton, yes. right? St. What, Thomas More. St. Thomas More. What, uh, what grade are you in? I'm in grade 10. What was the uh, most impressed you about the, the event? Um, when Reggie, Reggie Littlejohn shared her story and what she does for a living. And why was that meaningful to you? Um, because I am adopted from China. Well, I wasn't exactly raised up in a Catholic family. Mm. So I was in, well, I was involved with it, but I wasn't exactly fully right. in it. So you feel like uh, more led to, to practice now? Yes. And, oh, good. So are you motivated yourself to do something in the pro-life movement? Um, I am now. And your takeaway from this whole event? I'm just going to bring home what I've learned and just make sure my whole family is pro-life. Yeah. Yes. Well, great. Chloe, it's good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. I was just thinking, like, what could have happened to me if I were to stay there? If I have any other siblings, or what happened to my parents? Mm -hmm. Some people feel rejected by their parents, but you know what? Your mother loved you because she. It was very possible that she could have been um, running from a forced abortion, she, just like the woman I told you about that we saved from a forced abortion. That she was running from village to village to village to ex escape the family planning police. That your mother chose to do whatever she had to do to give you life. And she probably sacrificed very deeply to give birth to you. And then she no doubt 
uh, left you in a place where you be, would be found because you know, there, are pe there are people who are left to be found or like a, uh, left on the, in a park where they know that they're going to be found or, or left on the step to an orphanage where they know they're going to be found so that, um, and sometimes they even leave them with money on them so they could be taken care of and all that, uh, you know, so that you can know that your mother loved you because it would have been a lot easier for her to, you know, just to, to have an abortion, right? That would have been the normal thing, okay? So I'm sure that she sacrificed very deeply in the hopes that you would have a better life. And here you are, and you have a great life in the United States. I think that she would be so happy to know that and to yeah. see you and your, your shining eyes and how happy you are here in the United States. I am happy here. You are a living testimony against gendercide because it's people like you who are being lost. You, you are one of the pearls of China that are being aborted and people select against baby girls. And just your beauty, your intelligence, your charisma, how filled with life you are, your passion, puts you in a perfect position to say, please don't abort your baby girls. To meet you. Yeah.